right, let me start it up. You can go ahead and get started pretty much right now. It should be completely fine. It usually takes a minute to buffer, but yeah. All right, well, we have a lot of exciting updates. Um, one of the biggest, uh, let's see, is Kent on? I am indeed. Uh, you want to give a, 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 a demo? A we, I know you gave it on Monday with, with the Casper folks, but. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, this time um, I can actually give the full Hello World demo. So. Sweet. Yeah, yeah let's yeah. do it. So while, while Kent is setting up, I'll just say, so what, what, what's happened over the last week is we've got um, the compiler fleshed out to the point where we can run the, uh, not only compile, but run the Hello World contracts. Um, so the examples are compiling and Kent has the, um, the, the most basic one where uh, uh, compiling. We can talk about some of the technical stuff, uh, technical details um, on that. Um, after the, after the demo, but um, just the, the big takeaway is that Rolang is now compiling um, and the the um, to the Rosette base language RBL. Uh, so the source to source um, uh, compiler is is kind of hitting its first stage of completion, and then um, and then we're checking the correctness of that output. We ought to be able to run the output, and in fact, Kent can run the output. So. I'll, I'll hand it over to Kent to, uh, uh, to uh, give the little demo. Great, because in the last meeting, um, someone asked what my recommendation was for um, learning to program Rolang, and I had to say, picked and play with uh, Rosette, but I guess now we can just do it directly. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so... Um... Can everyone see my screen? I can see it. So, okay. so that, just to check, that means that in the upper right hand pane, uh, I see a, a Roland contract, hello world. Oh yes. Okay. So um, just to quickly go over the actual road contract. Um, so this is the hello world contract. Um, it takes in world one and world two. And it listens Which are for channels, right? these are channels, yes. And it takes in, um, or sorry, it waits for the pattern message on world one. And once it receives it, it sends that out on world two. And so here on the bottom, we have um, the the essentially this is an import statement that's needed, and this is the actual compiler and if we run the the contract through it um we actually get the the output of the or the, the rosette output of the the contract and so to test that this um rosette output actually works what we can do is um pass it through well um, Why don't we, we need, what, do you have a pretty, do you have a, a formatted version of the output so we could we could walk through it or do you want to run it and then walk through it? Yeah, um, so I was gonna actually copy it paste it into here. So this is the okay cool. Yeah, this is the formatted version of the contract. So let me just paste the the unformatted version just to show you that it is indeed the same. Um, so that, that was just a paste from below. Um, and so, oops, uh, let's go with the produce, I mean the proc. And so here, essentially everything's the same besides the, uh, fresh values, which is, um, supposed to be so because, um, they're just random hex values, but, um, this is the hello world contract and so let me actually just delete the above one um but and then the, the opera the opera is uh so we should we should talk about actor versus opera uh yes so the 
Hello World contract actor is um, so because Rolang uses the um, process model, but Rosette uses the actor model. We um, we sort of have this situation where we need to define an actor for you know for the contract, but um, the all the contracts have um, basically one method called hello world, or I mean not hello world, but like the contract name. And the idea here is that this allows us to um, essentially call the contract so, or call the method sort of recurse, not re well, yeah, recursively in the sense that you can call it within the body of the the method itself and so in the hello world we don't actually do that so it's kind of irrelevant but maybe in the future when we demonstrate some of the cell examples um i can go into more detail about what that means is that clear enough for now yeah for, for me it is but of course i'm completely immersed in this stuff <laughs> <laughs> jo joseph does it make sense Definitely. So, and I think, you know, from a contract, hello contract point of view, you need to explain the way you have, you know, the output is coming in Rolang. Um, because at this moment, I think I understand the methods, the way it's, I think, uh, methods, but the challenge for the end user would be, I mean, at least for the audience in this video would be what does it really mean? Because now they have to learn Rolang and then they have to run the Rosad, uh, you know, RBL. No, 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 no. This is just, this is just to explain the compiler. The, the end user never has to see this stuff. This is an intermediate step that we're, we're showing, um, we're, we're showing to illustrate our work because what, what, what he's about to do is he's going to paste or, or load this into Rosette, which is the second half of the compiler. So the compiler, to two is, is a good good observation I need actually so the compiler factors into two um, two compilation steps the first compilation step is a source to source compilation step from Rolang to RBL which is the Rosette base language the second compilation step compiles Rosette base language into Rosette bytecode so if you were so yeah we'll, we'll go ahead and run it and then we can show the compilation of the contract to Rosette bytecode and okay. I just want to add to you know, eventually I think end user will see the uh, Rosat implementation implementation. That's where actual contact will run, you know, to add to what we're doing. No. Okay. Oh no. We're, we're, we hide all of that. They never see the Rosette unless they're unless they're sort of, you know, heavyweight users. And ultimately we wouldn't be bootstrap. Um, so when we write Rolang and Rolang. There's no Rosette in anywhere in the mix. Oh, I meant, sorry, RoVM actually. Yeah, RoVM, yes, that's, that's correct. Yeah, so I guess the, the idea is that the RoVM is, you know, it's like the whole compiler plus the, the execution. Um, but anyways, um, is, is it at least clear about how, you know, this compilation process to execution process can be combined into one, but right now they're just like separate programs, if that makes sense. Yep, it is to me. Okay, okay. So, um, I guess to keep going, um, so, so, okay, so we have the, the output of the hello world.row um, contract in compiled Rosette code or RBL. And the, the thing about this is that, well, it's all fine and dandy, but um, there's no way to actually, or it, it, the hello world doesn't actually print, you know, like other hello world. So we need some, helper functions essentially and so here 
this is the hello world.rbl. Um, so the helper function simply is a printer. So the printer is basically just listening. Um, so it's kind of easier to see in the, the Rolang side. But when we send out a message on world two, there needs to be something that listens on world two and then prints out the actual message to confirm that, you know, this contract actually worked as intended. And so that is the printer. So all we're doing here is, you know, we've pasted in the hello world compiled contract and then we, you know, define the printer and then we um, instantiate both of them and then invoke the, their methods. And so the important part here is we well, can ignore the printer that just does the printing, but um, here we have hello world contract world one world two. So this invokes the contract and what happens when you invoke the contract, it, it goes in and essentially the first thing it does, it, it hits the consume method. And so that's the equivalent of the four here. But when it hits the consume method, it suspends because there's, at least in this script, the, um, there's, the data isn't, hasn't yet been sent because you know, we've first invoked the hello world contract and then we've, we're gonna, in the future, invoke produce, which is you know, the one that's sending the data. And of course, this can be reversed if you see the hello world produce file. Um, I'll go into that a bit later, but the important part for now is that the consume is suspending um, you know, this, this contract invocation. And so now it's waiting for the data to come in. And then, so, so if you actually look at the um, I won't go dive into too much detail here, but if you look into the um, consume function in space.rbl, um, you'll, you'll see exactly how the suspend happens. And what I want to highlight here is that it's going to print the debug waiting for data, at least on my setup. And, and so this is what we shall see when, so let me just um, switch over to um showing rosette um so just to be clear this is now the sort of second part um that is required for this compilation process and this is the um rosette vm which um and um so if we essentially start pasting in um what you know the the previous script I was showing you, which um, is just defining the namespace. Um, this is the hello world contract. And, and of course we have the, the printer and then invoking, I mean, defining both of them, contract and the printer, and then executing the 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 contract or invoking the contract method and then as as i mentioned before you see the debug waiting for data now you actually see it twice because the printer actually is suspending in the same way too but you can ignore that um and so the important part is that when we actually call produce which sends the data the the thread that the hello world was listening on is um, is resumed and then essentially if you saw from before um, the the actual message is sent to world 2 and then the printer just prints it out so we should just see hello world like that and so that completes the entire compilation process from hello world.row all the way to getting it actually printing hello world on the rosette side so yeah do you, that, <laughs> do, you uh, do you have a um uh, in the repo do you have the the uh, formatted um uh, compiled 
uh, Hello World. Oh, yeah, I yeah. see it. So let me just go over um, what's in the repo or like what, what people can play around with, so to speak. Um, so in the, so, you know, this is the, if you look at the left, you know, um, if you clone the Rolang repo, you'll see the examples folder and the source, this is where the actual, the meat of the compiler is and you can ignore everything else. Um, well, there's the readme. And so the readme will tell you how to set this all up. But um, so in the examples, you'll be able to see all three cell contracts um, or under sugar. And all of these are compiling. Um, we, I haven't tested whether they execute as desired or like the compiled version executes as desired on Rosette, but that will be next. Um, and then you should see hello world.row, of course. And then inside source main RBL, this is where um, all the Rosette related files are. And so um, space.rbl is essentially the tuple space implementation in, um, in Rosette that basically um, Greg had written, I don't, I don't know when, but, and then um, recently we just fixed this up and now it's, it, it should be in um, fine enough shape to run the hello world and probably the cell contract, but I should test that out before um, I say more. Um, but anyways, can, hello can world. Can you do me a favor? Mm -hmm. can, can, you, can you do the um, uh, compile, uh, code, uh, code dumb, compile quote, uh, and then the, um, uh, the call uh, to, uh, um, the, 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 the def actor expression, the def actor hello world contract. So, oh, I see on the rosette side. On the rosette side, exactly. Got it. Um, and then if you wouldn't mind pasting it into uh, Slack, um, I'll, I'm, I'm, while you're talking, I'm making a diagram so people can follow, I see, follow I see. The, um, the, the flow. Um, let's see. Code dump. Code dump. Compile. Um. So there's, um, I guess better just share my screen. So the, what happens is it says that there's no compiled time binding for deaf actor. Oh, and yeah, 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 sorry. Uh, that's, yeah, 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 that's, yeah. Uh, okay, so e easy, easy enough. Um, uh, just, just compile the invocation. Oh no, that's gonna be too simple. Uh, you uh, what you'd have to do is expand the def actor. Uh, don't worry about it then. We'll, yeah, yeah, we can we'll, resolve we'll, that we'll, we'll, today I'll, when we meet. I'll, I'll fix that. I'll fix that later. We, we, we have to call. We have to call expand on the def actor to get the RBL code that's undecorated by macros, and then from there you can call the compile. Um, I see, I see. So, but that, that I don't. I don't want to do that online. We can just take that offline and, and yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's done. So, I mean, uh, oh yeah, back to just, I think most, yeah, yeah. So I think I was explaining hello world, but um, so yeah, this is the hello world.rbl contract that's required for um, actually, you know, getting a hello world output from the Rosette VM. But here we have two um, hello world pseudo contracts that, um, sort of inline the, the printing. And so this is a more, this is not the actual output of the so-called, um, I mean the, the Roland compiler, but it, it's a more convenient output if that makes sense. And so here we have a version yeah. where we're invoking the contract first 
and then we're sending the data. But in the hello world produce first, we're actually sending the data first and then invoking the contract. So, you know, they, they both work and, um, you know, they show the different sides of the produce consume, um, you know, tuple space logic. And yeah, that, that's mostly what, what you can play around with now. It should be, you know, impossible to see what, um, it, it should be easily doable for the, the cell contracts, um, you know, something similar. And so, yeah, hope that, hope that made sense. Um, I think I'll turn it to whoever's next. Cool. No, thank you, Kent. That was really, really good. E excellent. I'm just uh, quickly summarizing um, in the diagram what people saw, so that'll be recorded. Um, and almost there, one second here. Um, Okay, so I'll do a quick screen share. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. So what people saw was the, the Hello World contract was inputted into the source to source compiler and that produced this Rosette base language. And then when Kent ran that Rosette base language, uh, in the Rosette REPL, what it did was to expand these uh, these macros, def operand and def actor, into uh, Arbel code, and then the Arbel code was compiled uh, into the bytecode compiler, and then uh, and then the REPL ran that uh, as well. So the REPL is read, compile, execute, and that's uh, that's uh, that's what what happened uh, in in the demonstration. So I'll, I'll make this uh, this little diagram. I'll, well, I'll augment this little diagram uh, and, and make that available as well. That uh, shows significant progress. And then if you um, look at the work that Mike has checked in, uh, you, you did check it in, right? <laughs> Mike, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. What? The, 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 um, you, you have code, you have B and FC code. Uh, for the, uh, the, the bytecode format. Yes, that's on the grammars branch of the Rosette uh, repo. Okay, excellent. So on the grammars branch, you can uh, see that the, the, we have a serializer uh, uh, for, and deserializer uh, for the Rosette bytecode, which means we can push it to the wire or push it to store and read it from the wire and read it from the store. So that's that's kind of the next thing in the chain. If you're, again, if you're thinking end to end, uh, the end to end uh, um, uh, application, um, you know, what we're going to have to do is to be able to store the bytecode in storage. That's essentially the, the that's, that's what's at the heart of storing the state of, the virtu of any particular virtual machine. And then we also need to be able to push bytecode out to the wire. And that's uh, that's a, a part of a part of the general um, uh, node to node communication. Uh, so that's that's uh, 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 how that piece fits into the the larger end to end uh, construction. Um, just a, awesome. Just, so just a quick question. Go ahead. Um, in the latest BNFC definition, I didn't see um, any definitions for address. Are those going to be added in the future, or do we have an alternate that we're using? Um, yeah, I'm not sure that an address is going to be different from here. I'll go, go to the BNFC right now. I think it's Rolang 2. Uh, okay, and um, so essentially addresses are chans, and I don't believe that there's going to be any, any um, specific difference uh, of address. We, we may have a, a, a special case of Chan called address, but that's what, that's what a Chan is. Okay. Um, uh, so, moving uh, right along, um, the, the work that actually, so, so Joe and I are, are getting even so if you look, if we go back to the diagram for a second, um, 
Joe and I gave a nice update on this. Um, what we actually Greg, we, I'm sorry, sharing, but um, I'm not. I'm not yet. I'm just going okay. back to the title. So where where the work that Joseph and I are doing fits in right here. So we're producing uh, something that would fit in the pipeline right here and produces a version of the contract that has the cost associated with it. So this would be this would be the um, source to source um, uh, pricing. Uh, Joe, did you say something? Uh, EQ. I've been calling it the EQ. Right, exactly. So what he calls EQ. Okay, and so what that produces is a pair, which is a contract. Oh, come on, machine. There we go. There we go. Okay. So strange. I don't know what it's doing. Gotcha, I'll just do that. Okay, so it produces a pair, which is a contract together with a four tuple. So I'll write the four tuple this way. Um, so it's um, uh, memory, um, storage, network, and compute essentially. Now it's slightly different in the EQ document, but I'm just doing this on the fly. Um, but it's a four tuple, which represents the, uh, the various cost components of the contract in terms of access to memory, access to storage, access to network, and, and uh, other compute uh, elements, you know, such as addition or, or things like that. And then that four, there's another part of the pricing model which takes the four tuple and reduces it to rev. Um, but so, so, so this, uh, this actually goes in a dog leg, um, you know, out this way before going, um, when, when, the, when the thing is really uh, doing everything it's supposed to do, uh, then we're talking about going this way into the source to source compiler. That way, any optimizations that you might want to run either at this stage or later stages have mm -hmm. access to the pricing model. Right. Um, um, so, so I can, I can kind so of that, go ahead. I can piggyback off of that and give a like a kind of a brief overview uh, based on yeah. what you're hearing, uh, kind yeah. of as an update. <clears throat> um, so if we look at the at the uh, at the contract, there are a few. Uh, there are a few components that we can start to pull apart. The, um, uh, for, for example, and, and kind of what I've been working on uh, this week is, um, is trying to get a, a trying to uh, write a method for getting the cost of, of an entity uh, when it's actually created. Um, so Greg, in the EQ document, when we wrote the input, we uh, quantified some part of the memory cost as the cost of the data that we're actually pulling from um, the channel, um, but uh, if we if we start from the bottom up, uh, it's it's much easier and, and more natural to actually quantify the size of the data and the cost of the data just from whenever it's created. That way, um, the the for or the input we can just take as a um, as a stream ultimately of, um, of of tokens and then and then kind of uh, map that. To whatever cost that we assign the the get operation, um, so in this one we would already have the cost of world one, world two, um, and of on the other side of the message that we're sending the the data size of that. <clears throat> um, so then essentially what's left in this anyway would be the cost of the four, uh, which is the getter in Rosette, and then uh, the return statement, which would uh, be the put in Rosette. Um, so that way we don't have to worry really about uh, crowding uh, kind of the calculation with um, of, of the uh, input and output statements or of any, of any of the other process statements with data calculations as well. And we can just take those as if uh, the data had already been computed. Um, additionally, I'm, uh, I'm writing 
kind of a spec right now for um, it kind of in the same thought for, for deciding when we may or in, in what cases we actually do need to allocate memory. So in those cases, it would be, um, for example, uh, new primitives, it'd be uh, new channels, it would be um, under proc, new structs, new uh, collections and such. And then uh, after we have those costs, then we can just operate on them and take the cost of the operation, as I said, rather than also including cost of that data inside of an unrelated operation. So that's uh, kind of what I've been focusing on this week. Cool. Yeah, yeah I, we should talk a little bit more about, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in this approach. It's a very interesting idea. Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, that's very good. So, so we're making progress on that front. Um, um, and and kind of. And then, uh, so. Sorry. Go ahead. No, well, I, was, you. I was. Sorry, I was, I was kind of wondering. Um, in order to, I mean, ultimately, we've decided that we want the cost annotations to occur at the high level. We want it to be um, kind of as. Uh, I'm imagining like in the front end somewhere before we get to the IR um, so that we can attach costs as attributes to uh, the grammar items. Um, mm -hmm. But as we've, as we've said before, and this is not going to be anything that, uh, that a front user would see, but uh, between kind of the people working on the project, we would see that ultimately those costs would be derived based on their, um, their implementations at a, at a much lower level. So it seems like, um, we may have to kind of run through the, the compilation process um, almost twice, like once um, up to the point where we get our, uh, where we look for the cost annotations and then run through the rest until we get to instruction selection and then map that cost back to the, um, back to attributes and then optimize after. So in the first kind of run, you get uh, no optimization in what the codes would ultimately boil down to then. And then the second run, you have cost up, you have cost and then you optimize based on cost. Um, is, and, and that's kind of the method, the only way that really I've been thinking we can uh, make it available in the compiler, compiler pipeline. What are your thoughts on that, Greg? Uh, I mean, I'm certainly not a, a, a verse to a two pass compiler. Um, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, on the other hand, you know, uh, like even in the EVM, the, the resource allocation, um, you know, is not mapped directly onto um, instruction. We can, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's mapped onto the EVM abstraction, but not onto hardware abstractions. Right. They right. don't, they don't assignment gas to uh, on the basis of the cost of accessing you know a particular type of memory or the cost of accessing uh, in, uh, running instructions on arm versus you know x86 or whatever right so that's not um that's not something that they do and the industry is perfectly happy with that at this point yeah um, I mean, I so we can we can give um a kind of um we can just Justify the numbers in terms of some experiments that we run, um, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, estimate those numbers, or we can be more granular. And you know, the, the main thing is we don't want to be it, we don't want the it to be over engineered at least for the first uh, the first release. Of so, course, I'm always for the simplest thing that works. More and more um, granular. Yeah, exactly. 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 Yeah. And and I mean, and that only makes sense because I mean, it it's it's I mean non-trivial it's and to you know to, to to try to come up with with cost annotations that map directly on the machine instructions architecture is just very way too much to even attempt to do that um but so so what the ev or what ethereum does is they they make different classes i think they break it up into about five different cost classes um in charge based on that so uh, say like some of the most of the memory operations um or uh, you know the primitive memory operations um, that exists that uh, the processor can carry out belong to a specific class and then storage operations to a class above that. Exactly. And then, uh, bitwise exactly. operations, bitwise operations or uh, in a class uh, there. And then at the cheapest, the lowest level, at the zero level, they use um, return and halt as to just be no cost. 
So I'm definitely a proponent of taking a similar approach and breaking up uh, into cost classes. And essentially the only, like, like, the main difference here is not really the method by which we derive the costs. The, the difference here is the method by which we apply those cost derivations. So instead of it being a runtime or a, you know, like a, like a, a dynamic computation, we're just allowing it to be a static one. And that's get, correct. That's, a, that's exactly true. Yeah. So you can either estimate upfront, uh, and in which case it's, you know, yes more static right um, yeah. or you can, or you can try to be um more um more accurate which means it's more dynamic uh, yeah um and and, 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 and multi-pass architecture i was talking about before where you can imagine that each of these little intermediate things in a in a comp compilation pipeline is stored to the blockchain uh, for with access to tools, right? So then the tools you can have this whole ecosystem of tools and if someone wants to pay uh, both the economic cost and the, the cost in compile time um, to to get multi-pass compilers that get you know, which are highly optimized and and tuned in terms of cost um, Then that's a that's a reasonable model. I don't I don't I don't we, we want it to be open-ended so that, you know, if people want to do that, they can do it. Exactly. So it's, it's kind of just building on like another, another, um, it's kind of just building on another level of pretty much what, what is static and dynamic analysis. It's also, I mean, I imagine that at some point we probably won't do this initially, but at some point, um, you know, you know, like whatever we can't statically analyze, uh, that we could do, uh, you know, a, a dynamic analysis as well and uh, make a cost component that is, you know, that maybe even exists at runtime, similar to how the EVM does now. So it's kind of a, um, a composition of, of both approaches, possibly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. So then uh, along those lines, kind of expanding the, the scope of the conversation, Ed and I have been um, sort of, we, we've worked out, uh, um, nomenclature for the various releases um, so the first release where you know people can start you know ma making tokens minting them uh, putting them in wallets and sharing them uh, across nodes and that we're calling that mercury um, and then we'll you know each new release will will go we'll pick the planet scheme um, so the, then there'll be a Venus release an earth release you know Mars and so on um, and and there will be a, a preview um, before Mercury, so there'll be a Mercury preview um, uh, for you know the intrepid to use those those who are not afraid to fly too close to the sun. Um, uh, we're, we'll we'll offer that as well, but we won't recommend that anyone uh, do anything uh, serious with that at all. Yeah, it also, um, it also so that. Uh, it also means that anybody who still considers Pluto a planet will not be able to use the platform. <laughs> we didn't say we didn't say whether or not Pluto was considered <laughs> was in the release schedule. <laughs> um, uh, so so uh, and and this this is this is nice because you know there are enough heavenly bodies uh, out there to have. Uh, have and you know um, use the release scheme forever, <laughs> right? For for as long as, as people are are um, are, are going to be around to to be interested in releases of the of the platform, um, so so that's uh, um, it, it's useful to have that kind of nomenclature because then what we can start um, putting dates to those those releases, right? So. Uh, what, what we said was uh, Mercury will be 12 months from closing um, uh, of the, uh, the, the stuff with Auto Capital. And that leads us to our next update, which is that is going quite well. We're uh, meeting with partners. Um, well, we're doing a dry run with partners this Friday, um, kind of a friendly fire session. Uh, and uh, I, Ed was going to be here, but his daughter's uh, at a graduation ceremony. Um, he has more details on the, on the calendar there. Uh, so that's, that's going very well. And um, uh, 
So, so the, again, the point is that relates to our release schedule. The, the Mercury preview uh, will come out considerably before then. I'm not giving dates just yet. Um, it really depends upon um, how the, how the code, uh, coding is going. But if it's going at this pace, it will be considerably sooner than that. Um, so, so that's that update. Uh, let's see, does anyone else have any questions or comments or, or anything they, they uh, want to uh, ask about uh, what we've said so far? I'm a little uh, curious um, how, uh, the in, how, the, how the encryption um, computations are going are gonna to work um, because Rosette uses uh, what I mean, uh, uh, just like about a 32 bit word size. Um, and, uh, but I mean, but the EVM is ob has obviously uh, chosen a much larger word size and their rationale for doing so is just that it makes, um, you know, uh, like the Shaw computations much, much easier and much more feasible um, with that word size. What, uh, how can we, I guess, anticipate some sort of uh, compensation on the side of Rosette or are we just gonna, uh, pretty much do the same things, but with the standard 30, 32-bit. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, first of all, the, um, the, most, the most important thing about the um, Rosette VM rewrite is that it, it re refreshes uh, those constraints, so it will be uh, the larger word size. Um, and uh, so, so that's that's a non-issue. It's we're only limited to the existing thirty-two. That's what we had with the C plus plus implementation. Uh, and uh, oh, actually, that that uh, that also brings up another point on the refresh. Um, one of the things that Kent didn't mention was that last week we kind of had some some fun and excitement uh, recognizing that the um, the delimited continuation. Um, uh, uh, implementation um, in uh, special K of this execution semantics is is more more flexible and I can kind of describe um, how it is and why it is uh, and what it does uh, the the solution that the, it's more flexible than um, the uh, uh, reflective method approach uh, and the way um, uh, the, the discipline that Rosette has on continuations. So the discipline on Rosette is much, much more strict than delimited continuations. And, and one way to think about it is um, you can uh, consume, uh, provide you suspension on IO, um, but how that's related to the occurrence in the code the context in the code of the IO um, can be separated and linked. Those are essentially two um, regions that are siblings um, in the continuation, then the tree of continuations allowed by the delimited continuation approach. In uh, Rosette, um, you don't have a tree, essentially, you have a, a strict one line stack from the point of view of the returning context. Uh, you don't have a, you don't, you don't have a tree. Um, and as, uh, as a result, you can't do the separation of the returning context um, versus the suspensions. Um, so if you look here in the hello world contract, right, um, this for uh, the call, this call here becomes the consume now the consume will suspend uh, so when you enter the consume method on the tuple space if you go look at that code over there you'll see that it's an r method and if there's no data there the continuation is squirreled away in a data structure um, and uh, and so the thread is suspended but you can have a distinction in in the delimited continuations world you can have a dis suspension and the suspension associated with this code context. Here's the data access versus where we return into um, in the larger code context. Um, and for, uh, for Rosette, um, these have to be one and the same. And the consequence is that we have to inline these consumes. 
if you look at the Scala implementation, um, you don't in like consume, you can put a monadic wrapper around the consume. So this becomes a map on, uh, on a data structure that channel and the tuple space together. That constitutes a monad. So the tuple space and the channel together make a monad, and then you can, you can call the monad API on that, and that will return you, um, when the consume returns, it will return this code context and launch this continuation. So there's a kind of separation of concerns that's, that's available there. The reason this is interesting is because when we do the Rosette VM refresh, not only will we be refreshing the, um, the word size, but we'll also be refreshing the continuation semantics to be more relaxed about the discipline. Since we know exactly how the, um, I've, I've done a deep dive over the years on the, on the delimited continuation semantics, and, and this is all well documented in the literature anyway. We can, uh, we can um, relax the continuation semantics that we cooked up in the Rosette VM ages ago, and that will be another another part of the refresh. Um, so, so, so the long-winded answer, Joseph. Sorry, sorry for the the detour, but the the first the first part of the answer is is that um, it's not an actual limitation, um, and has you know we've we planned all along to do a refresh, and that that refresh will be available in the Mercury release. Um, However, uh, we're, we, we, need to be, we need to be a little bit more uh, circumspect about what's being crypt, encrypted and decrypted. Um, and the word size limits are actually orthogonal uh, to the encryption and decryption um, uh, techniques, at least in this architecture. Um, that it, it doesn't have the same kind of, in the EVM architecture, I can, I can see how they might have those issues, but in this, in this architecture, the, those two concerns are, are sort of at right angles to each other. Um, so even if we did have on um, have that constraint, it wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be a limiting constraint. Uh, so that's uh, that's the, the the other side of that. Uh, so, but thank thanks for the question. Um, any other questions, comments, concerns? Awesome. Silence is golden. Uh, I'll give a quick update. Where, uh, in terms of the financial profile, we've got our resources. The, the co-op's resources are, are because of the big run-up um, on uh, cryptocurrency. The co-op is, is, is quite uh, well situated. Um, we're doing our best to kind of um, minimize our exposure. Um, however, it's been kind of tricky uh, because try to um, fund addresses where we have assets, um, uh, the network fees shift on me. <laughs> we're, we're paying exorbitant, exorbitant amounts of uh, fees to the network, um, which is causing us, uh, causing me no end of headache because operations that should be like a single, a single button click are, are you know, causing, uh, turn, turning into half hour or hour-long operations uh, as I have to go through the loop to try to uh, recalculate uh, based upon projected network fees uh, what it's going to take to move assets from from one um, uh, move move value from one asset to another so that's uh, uh, but I'm I'll try to get a, give a, a detailed profile on that and I'm also desperately trying to get out from under this load and hand it over to HJ and Lisa <laughs> Um, uh, as as best as I can. Um, uh, so I'm just I just want to I want to leave the house in relatively uh, a decent order for them to be able to to pick it and start um, uh, uh, sh sharing the load with them. So that's um, that's uh, a quick update on the on the the financial profile. If any people have any questions about that. I know that uh, some uh, someone on Slack had reached out that they hadn't received their rocks. Um, I went and checked into it, and we did send the rocks, um, and I've, I've sent them their the, the transaction ID um, uh, on the on the Ethereum blockchain. But if anyone else has any questions about uh, that they haven't received any rocks or anything like that, please don't don't hesitate. Just contact us immediately. Um, and then finally. Um, I want to uh, 
several people have come forward again. So this is in addition to uh, people who came came forward back in January, and February, March uh, about investing. Um, and and what I've what I've said to to them is uh, help organize. Um, so if if people want some, uh, the we're too busy executing to do any kind of sale or anything like that. Um, we just, we, we just, you know, all of our focus right now is on delivering what we said we would deliver to, to the community. If people want to handle the headaches of, of a sale and, and making that sale fair with respect to, um, uh, with respect to the, the redemption process and the current rock holders, um, then I suggest that you, you self-organize, get together, you know, sub channel on slack communicate with each other and put a proposal together um, uh, to uh, the board now I know that um, Alex Vulcan of coin fund has said that at least in the past he indicated that um, if uh, if people come forward and really want to do that um, then they will help with the sale they'll help with the, the organization and all of that so if, if people uh, that's great um, I personally don't have the cycles, uh, so if, 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 you, if you want to organize some, some, something along those lines, get together, you know, uh, figure out the details of what's going to be a fair proposal that the whole community accepts and gets behind, um, you know, uh, get, get, get folks who can help with the logistics like CoinFund or others, um, and then uh, come with a fleshed out proposal uh, the board. Um, the co-ops board, and if it's a if it's a sound proposal, um, then I'm I'm not opposed. I'm not. I'm certainly not going to uh, uh, prevent it from happening. Um, but it, it, that really should be a kind of community effort because um, you know uh, you know most are just heads down now trying to trying to to get the thing uh, out the door. Um, that, so so again, if there are any questions about that, don't hesitate to to contact me. Uh, and that, that did raise another point. Let me see if I can page it back in now. Uh, uh, shoot, it's gone. Um, but so let me let me uh, check in with folks. Uh, uh, any, any other questions, comments, concerns? Yes, I have one question. Um, yes. Is there any news about uh, the membership uh, boarding on and the what Evan is doing with the state approvals? Uh, yes, so I believe that he has uh, filings with at least one state. Uh, I have to double check with Evan on that, but that's my current understanding uh, that he's got filings. And as soon as we, uh, as soon as we know the status of those filings, we'll move forward with membership at least uh, membership at least for those states. Um, where he where he has filings, um, so yeah, that's a. That, um, it also reminds me that as soon as we do have filings, then I'm going to start opening up um, uh, member channels of communication, um, uh, so that so that we can uh, uh, um, uh, have uh, conversations like in uh, that that aren't as noisy that are a little bit efficient and productive um the this the slack has become super noisy um and so yeah uh, uh but i you know please hj ping evan you know just uh get him uh, ask him directly okay fine Uh, let's see, there was one other thing. I can't, uh, to my tongue, I can't think about it. Uh, I can't, I can't page it in. Um, oh yeah, uh, so we had a really good conversation uh, with uh, an engineer, a local engineer here in Seattle um, that um, we think is gonna pick up the, the comms work. Um, so uh, we're excited. It looks like that's going to be accelerating because um, that's that's a that's a piece of the puzzle that we haven't talked about is the node-to-node -node communication. 
Um, so uh, we, we uh, Navneet uh, and um, Nash Foster, uh, myself and, and Chris, this engineer, met at Cafe Ladro here in West Seattle um, and had a really good conversation about uh, the requirements for the node-to-node -node communication. Um, and uh, that's uh, uh, a, a, the high level, uh, I, I think, I think that's uh, you know a really good fit, uh, and I think we can see that work starting to accelerate. Um, so um, looking forward to that. Um, also, um, the co-op spent some uh, the co-op and holdings company um, met with uh, Eugene Fine, uh, who was um, uh, actually responsible for kind of I mean. Uh, Eugene and his developers were the most uh, productive and helpful in the, um, the completing the work with Vulcanize. Um, so, so we met with them and um, uh, we may be engaging them as well. Uh, so that's a, um, uh, that, that conversation is ongoing. Uh, we'll have to um, uh, you know, talk through that, but that uh, uh, another possibility. We certainly enjoyed their engagement, and, and Eugene has been here a couple of times. Um, and you know, uh, I don't think he ever played his ukulele, but <laughs> um, you know, it was a. Uh, he he seems to be a really good guy and uh, really quite interested in the work that we're doing. All right, um, I'm out of I'm out of updates. Uh, and is there in, anything else we want to talk about before we? We, um, um, uh, you know, adjourn the meeting. I guess I'd, uh, I'd just like to express, um, going back to the, to the idea of, of a, um, an ICO, kind of, that I, that I think that there are, um, there's a significant need for uh, accessible and clear documentation of all of our, all of the important platform components and of that being, you know, kind of, um, more, more sleek, I guess, and available uh, to the community, I think, before we try to, to run one. Um, just so that when we do, um, that, you know, it's, that, it, that it's, that it's as good as it, it's, it's the best it possibly could be, because we only get, you know, kind of one shot at that. Um, so I think that, that any sort of crowd sale would have to be preceded by um, an initiative to get the, to get the documentation set and get it um, polished. Uh, so I, I agree with you. Uh, what, one thing you may not know is, is how um, polished it is. Uh, we've been going through a, a really, really um, huge uh, level of polishing to get in front of um, uh, uh, partners with Auto Capital. Uh, so there's a, there's a uh, now of course, the, the their concerns are, are more on the financial side and less on the technical side. They're just trusting on the technical side um, more uh, than uh, than someone in in this community. Um, so I, I absolutely uh, applaud your your um, your impulse. I think that's that's spot on. I, I agree, um, and I think uh, Alex Vulcan from CoinFund expressed a similar sentiment. He wants everything to be quite clear uh, and that's one of the reasons why um, uh, at the end of this month uh, we're going to um, uh, we're, we're going to be having him out to help with the tutorial uh, for the um, uh, for for Rolang so that's that's a part of that uh, that's a part of that documentation and getting everything uh, uh, nicely um, uh, explained uh, and 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 clearly articulated. Um, so so yeah. On the other hand, um, uh, what is your feeling about um, if there's a group of investors or would be investors or potential investors who who come to us and say, no, we've already done our due diligence. We just want to buy, right? Um, so and and here are the terms where we want to buy and the community feels that those terms are, are fair to those who participate in the redemption process and, and other 
other stakeholders. Do you then feel that documentation is a gating factor for, the, for that event? I think that it's not a gating factor for that specific amount of investor of investment coming from that specific group of people. But if I were asked, you know, would you prefer an open source initiative over private investment? Well, that depends. I mean, on uh, you know, compared to the size. Oh, no, no, no. Hang, hang, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. The, we're not talking about um, people taking equity. We're simply talking about people who are interested in buying rocks. Exactly. So, yeah. so if, yeah. let's say that, you know, there's a small sub community and what they want to do is they want to buy rocks from the co-op and, and they have put forward a proposal that the people who participate in the redemption process and other people in the community feel is fair. And they have said, no, we've done our due diligence. We don't need any more documentation. We just want to buy rocks. Do they need, should, should we, should that be gated? Hmm. I'd have to, I mean, my initial... Can I, can I suggest something? Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I like the Lika, Lika's model. Uh, Lika is an exchange in Switzerland, as everyone probably is aware of. They uh, deliver and then do another crowd sale, deliver, do another crowd sale, deliver, do another crowd sale, until they're, probably until their treasury is completely gone. Um, that way, if they're slowly releasing rocks into the market, but it's only, um, it's like every single time they do the crowd, it's like, look, Here's your Ethereum integration. This is why we raised $2 million. Okay, let's go to the next thing. These are the next big releases we're rolling out. Can we get another $2 million? Or whatever it is. That's now, I, they may have different mechanics every single time they go to the next sale, but you get the point. The point is, hey, we delivered. Yes, well, absolutely. Well, that, that, that's the intent. Yeah, that's, that's our intent anyway. That, that's exactly right, right? Um, what, what we're calling delivery is, however, is lined up with the planets, so to speak. Um, Right, so, so our, our fir the first point where we say we really have delivered is Mercury. Um, and at that point, if we wanna talk about a crowd sale, um, then you know, it might make sense. We're, we're in this lucky position where we, we don't really have to do that. And that's what makes this a little bit unique. Like we're, we, don't, we don't need additional capital. What we need to do is execute. Um, but there are people who are pestering us. <laughs> I mean, I, I say that nicely, right? I'm not trying to <laughs> insult anyone. It's just, but there are people who are coming forward and saying, how can I buy? How can I participate? And we don't want to turn people away from participating. Um, so so that's, well, you, the, you mentioned, that, that's the position we're in. You mentioned CoinFund. You mentioned Alex. But I, I know Vicenis could also help because that's his, really what he excels at. So Token Card just concluded their... ICO, uh, and I mean, if this is planned out over a three month period, you could do it with CoinFund and New Alchemy, which is Peter's thing. So, I mean, the business partners to handle that stress load should be good as long as the contracts have been made clear and obviously the terms and conditions of the sale are sound. So- Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, I don't see it. I don't see the hiring the right people to do the crowd sale correctly. It's not a problem. I think it's it, it is, it's just going to come back on you guys. If that's taking up too much of your, your your bandwidth, I can totally understand. But then you could transfer that liability to a third party. Like, look, if you fuck this up, it's not on us. <laughs> it's on you. So <laughs> do, it, well, do it correctly. This is, this is what I was saying. This is what I was trying to do was to, was to get it off my shoulders. And we say, look, if all of you folks out there who've approached me about wanting to get in, well, if you if you want to get in, here's the requirements. You know, come up come come up with a proposal that's fair to all of of these existing stakeholders, right? Um, come up with someone who's who's going to execute, and here are some names uh, who are going to execute the crowd sale, and then put that as a as a sound proposal to the board, right? And then and then I think Joe added a nice one, which is as a part of that proposal, we need to make sure that due diligence um, is is nailed down, right? What constitutes due diligence, um, you know, is is either present or, or will be present at the time of the sale. Well, then right? I think so. I think, so we, I think have be, we have to be very careful with our language um, and what we actually call the, you know, the the crowd sale for Rev. Because if 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 buying is essentially open to anybody, or or if anybody can purchase rocks right now and rocks are ultimately transferable um, to you know to Rev, then it's essentially just that we're selling Rev already. Um, so I, I, I think that that possibly opens us up to, you know, avenues of, of scrutiny, certainly as if like, you know, we couldn't call the rev offering really in ICO, or if we do, there's, there's going to be, um, there's going to be resistance to that. 
whatever whatever the decision is, I think that if some parties are allowed to purchase rocks, then everybody should be allowed to purchase rocks. I think the point is you highlight it, Joseph. It's it's what it's what party is selling. And uh, again, if you have a contractual relationship with a third party, it's on them. So whether that's uh, I mean I don't want to I, I don't really want to say the names again. Uh, the coin fund new alchemy if they're interested in organizing that I'm sure they both have lawyers to review everything and take care of those terms and conditions and you can also do it Through other exchanges for example, like maybe bitrex can organize a sale for you um, If anybody's gonna have yeah, a problem, no, it's, it's a very good point yeah. If anyone's gonna have a problem, it's gonna be bitrex before our chain I can assure you that you can do as much due diligence right now with your lawyers, but I'm sure You know bitrex has a much harder time than you guys, but it's still a good yeah. point. I just, I don't want to give, yeah. I don't, no, I, don't I, I, think it would be, I think it would be potentially, um, I think there's a little bit of dissonance if, you know, if, if it ever could even be, you know, speculated that we gave uh, certain investors precedence over the rest of the community. That's the only point that I'm making. You're absolutely right. And I, I agree with you. That's a, it's, it's, it's well considered and, and that has to be like, but again, I think I think we can address that by saying by saying, if you want to participate, self-organize, and remember that in order to be fair to the community, you know you have to make the sale open to those who are who want to participate, right? So so, so there has to be some period of notification, uh, has to be some period during which the during which it you know think the sale is open, and then and then a clear closing date, right? So that I think that would uh, but, but, I, but I, I want to put it out to those folks who really want that. If they truly want it, <laughs> if they're really hungry for it, they'll do the self-organizing. And if not, you know, well, basically what I said was, well, bring me the broom of the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> um, uh, but that reminded me of an important uh, of that thing that I kept forgetting and, and needed to talk about. I'll just say that very quickly and then I wish we'll, we'll close there. Um, so Ed um, and Evan and David Otto and I had, um, and this is with Otto's uh, uh, hat on as, a, as, as counsel to co-op and holding. Um, so we had a, a, a clarifying discussion on um, the notion of economic tokens. Uh, so, so just and we, we've prepared a document, and there will be a board resolution around this. So, so people um, can can uh, I'll, I'll say it now, and then we'll put the document out. So, people have asked repeatedly, "Will there be multiple economic tokens?" So, we need to we need to we need to refine that language. Um, so, in in particular, um, uh, right now, even on Ethereum, there are multiple economic tokens. Right, the, all the ERC twenty tokens are economic tokens. Do they have the same status as Ether? Um, no, they don't. You can't you can't trade uh, a rock, for example, directly for gas. Uh, and in fact, it actually costs um, the co-op uh, Ether in order to run uh, transactions related to rocks. Um, which means yeah, which means we have to have Ether available. Um, so on, likewise, on our chain, there will be many of the, we, we fully anticipate there will be many such economic tokens, right? These will be ERC 20 like now, will those be staking tokens in the sense of, uh, staking for, for the proof of stake, you know, the Casper protocol? No, uh, no, they won't. So there's another question of will there be multiple staking tokens? And here, the, the, the jury is out. We do not know if this is technically feasible. Um, however, that we can do this, that we can have multiple staking tokens, then we will offer or, or, or create multiple tokens that's to everyone's advantage. We do recognize, however, that those people um, who hold rocks to convert at a one for one or rev um, need their uh, need some assurances that their their investment has been protected, and so we we will control that by the rate 
of, um, of staking token to phlogiston. Um, and we will privilege for a period of 12 months the rev um, to have 10 to 1 um, uh, uh, rate. So, you know, if you hold the rev against another uh, staking, rev will be worth 10 times as much phlogiston as the other staking token. So hopefully that will be very, very clear. Um, if, you, if, you, if you look at the numbers and you look at the total supply, for example, of ether, and you co co uh, contemplate the idea of a staking token that is somehow tethered to ether. So our chain uh, decides that there's a, um, uh, a staking token that mirrors or reflects ether and that um, the distribution of that staking token will, will uh, eg exactly reflect the, the uh, distribution of uh, ether today. Um, then uh, th there would potentially be an attack against the rev. However, if you, uh, if you then factor in um, the 10x um, uh, rate of conversion to phlogiston, um, then, uh, a, um, um, then for ether, you know, uh, rev still dominates uh, by by uh, by several factors. Uh, likewise for for Bitcoin, and those are kind of the two uh, the two sort of biggest examples that we would want. So to rather contact. than rather than taking um, so rather than taking on the complexity of, of tethering or of giving. Uh, precedence to any sort of token, why not just leave it to the exchanges as it already is? And, you know, if, if you want, if you have either and, you know, you want rev, then you buy rev on an exchange and now you have a certain amount of your ether that's available in rev and it's kind of price neutral because it, it seems like there would be a scenario possibly where the, the, the precedence of rev on the platform to, to ether just says, you know, uh, is 10 to one, but the price of rev and the price of ether do not correspond to that ten to one ratio. Um, so uh, 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 agreed, but then someone doesn't have to go. Someone doesn't have to do uh, an exchange in that way. What we what we have determined is that it's very very advantageous to have multiple staking tokens. If you have only a single staking token, um, uh, then you have a, a distribution problem on the one hand that has to be solved. And on the other, um, you have the pressure to fork, because, pricely because of the distribution problem. So, um, the distribution be problem, problem, like I said, be just handled by the existing exchanges? No, 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 it isn't. Um, and, and that actually uh, creates a kind of uh, competition where there doesn't have to be a competition, right? What we want is to smooth, we want to smooth out the transition um, from uh, from one network to the other, and that's that's not handled by the exchanges. Um, so so we 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 would like like very much uh, for uh, parties that are unhappy with the distribution of rev to be able to make their own staking token without forking our chain. All right, so they can they can they can come up with their own distributions. Um, uh, and it's simply adjusting a particular parameter within our chain as opposed to forking the code base. So that, that keeps every, and, 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 and therefore, you know, you have a much, much smoother path uh, uh, between or across or amongst those, those subnetworks. So it's kind of that, it's, it sounds like it would be similar to having, you know, uh, say, Say having having you know token creation contracts where you can create your token sure, um, and the tokens created are all still kind of like a sub token of of what rev would be. But um, on the other hand, you could use existing tokens, Bitcoin and Ethereum, that would be sub tokens of rev still, except those um, pre existing would be tethered to the cost of of rev to. Ethereum or, 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 or of rev to essentially anything else. So, so that's we, right. So, so the, so like uh, ether and Bitcoin would be treated similar as like a kind of like a sub coin of rev, except they're tethered to an outside price. That's correct. Yeah. 
Um, so anyway, uh, a lot of this is all, um, you know, speculative because we don't know if it is technically feasible to, um, uh, to have multiple staking tokens. So this is all contingent upon um, working out all of the mathematics there. Um, so so if, that, if, that, if that works out, we will make it available. And because we will make it available, we have to then allay any concerns that um, current investors or potential investors have to uh, might have about uh, the multiple staking tokens and, and what that does to their own uh, particular um, uh, 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 supply of rocks, uh, which will then convert to red. So that's uh, just wanted to make sure that everyone understood um, the position that co-op is taking currently. Um, and, and there will be a board resolution uh, uh, to reflect this position. Uh, and uh, uh, the, I guess uh, all of those resolutions are, uh, uh, Evan has been publishing those uh, in uh, GitHub. So people can, can, can see the, the nature of that, uh, that resolution and the, the language around um, this whole discussion is is being prepared in a document. Uh, uh, the document is is uh, online right now, but we haven't released it to the to the community just yet. Okay, that's absolutely all of my updates. <laughs> um, we're way over. We're almost twenty minutes over. So I'm I'm ready to jump off unless there's a, you know burning questions. Sure, I'm ready to, to jump off. Uh, Greg, could we um, jump on a on a Zoom chat for like five minutes after this? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Talk to you. See you later, everyone.